episode two. We'll call it the meeting to order. And I'll try again my little speech here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and taking part of, in our community forum tonight. Thank you for the people that are here in person, our administrators and our board members, and to the people that are online, also board members and administrators and community members. Uh, before we get started, however, I think it's really important to take a few moments to address what so many of us are feeling right now. Uh, our hearts are literally aching, at least mine is. Uh, 21 people, 19 of them innocent children, killed for reasons we do not and cannot understand in a small town in Texas. 10 people killed in Buffalo, just going about their daily business. Thousands of civilians still in Ukraine, millions of family displays, and closer to home, we are here about threats to our own small schools. It is a lot to take in, and for many of us, it's too much. Eh, we've never lived in times like this. I guess some of us have, maybe, but we aren't sure eh, what to do. So let's start tonight by saying I understand. We are with you. Eh, I know many people are frightened, but th that the world we knew just a few years ago seems to have vanished. First, it was the pandemic, then the war in Ukraine, and now we read about gun violence on a daily basis. We, we may live in, a little, in little Vermont, but we are not isolated from the world, and the sorrows of our neighbors in Texas, New York, and Maripol are our sorrows, too. It, so let's pause for a minute. Let's set our anxieties down just for a moment, and let's think about where we are, who we are. Maybe more importantly, let's think about who we want to be and how we can begin to turn things around. The world maybe is maybe in a difficult place right now, but there are things that we can do right here in Tini, Vermont to help make it a better place. First and foremost, we as a board and as administrators have a duty of care to protect our children. That means making sure our schools are places where students feel safe and welcome. Part of the violence we're seeing unfold across the country is being penetrated, perpetrated. I thought about not putting this word in because I have such a hard time pronouncing it, but I was trying to be fancy. By individuals who are isolated and lonely, who do not have or have lost a system of support. Individuals who are angry and biased, individuals who have lost hope. And one of the most important things that we can offer our students and one another is an environment that strives to understand, to alleviate the impacts of bias, prejudice, and discrimination. People who feel supported, accepted, and understood don't generally act out in ways that we have seen unfold across our country in recent months. In a letter to families, I know that not everybody gets Stephen's letters, but in a letter to families, Stephen uh, wrote, and I'm just gonna quote him, because I couldn't write it better. We must strive to root our hatred, violence, racism, homophobia, bullying, and harassment. We will not succeed by canceling others. We will succeed in creating a strong and supportive school when we recognize that we will have a role in helping each other succeed. We must speak up when we hear others being put down or call names. We must speak up when we know one of our friends or colleagues is suffering and needs help. We must make sure that we all have support and that we know others care about us and want to us and wants us to thrive. End of quote. These are steps we can take to protect our students and each other from outside violence and be assured we will be discussing steps in the coming weeks or months. But in the meantime, our best hope for grading schools and communities where we feel safe, where we all are, have opportunities to grow and become the best person that we can be, be it begins to create an inclusive learning environment, a place where everyone feels welcome regardless of their color, gender, orientation, size, culture, maybe <laughs> should just say regardless of any difference. Despite the recent dark times in this country has seen, and despite the very real problems facing humanity, pandemics, climate change, war, sorry, you're gonna have to put up with me tonight. <laughs> there is still too much to be grateful for, so much to look forward and to so much to celebrate, especially here in our beautiful small community. This week, our governor signed two acts, one providing universal school meals to our students and one adjusting the school funding formula that will improve equity and provide better education quality and funding oversight. Closer to home, just today, we raised the progress pride flag over the high school, a symbol that all students are welcome, supported, and accepted here. It is a small gesture, but it means so much to the segment of our population, students and faculty alike. 
that has long suffered under the burden of misunderstanding and discrimination. Okay. So thank you for letting me share these thoughts with you tonight. My heart is still aching and my eyes fill with tears when I think of the pain of loss of so many people have experienced. But I believe we can turn things around in this country and, and this trends around we can reach out to those who feel lost, abandoned, left behind, or marginalized. And we can invite them into our communities. We can build bridges of understanding, and maybe, just maybe, others will see what we're doing and follow our lead. Okay, now to where I'm supposed to be. The purpose of tonight's forum is to present the draft of our continuous improvement plan and how it intersects and complements our public, uh, our ESSER funds and our uh, Washington Central Unified Union moving forward plan. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again for your support and the interest in providing our students and your children with the tools they need to live in meaningful and productive lives. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Jen. All right, so thanks for, thank you so much. Um, we are gonna, present the continuous improvement plan. So Mark, if you can share the screen, please. We're gonna pull it up. And, um, and just to kick it off, just so everybody knows, a number of uh, my colleagues in this room are gonna help with this presentation. So you'll hear from uh, more than me. The floor just set the context beautifully for our work tonight. Do you want to do the mission statement? Next slide. Yes. And oh, and we wait. Yeah, yeah you aren't seeing. We it haven't yet. shared it on the. It needs to be shared on the on the screen. Well, Mark is doing that. It just it's like a community forum, and I did forget one little piece and just to remind everybody to be kind and there's no wrong questions tonight and hopefully if, if there's anything in the wording that you don't understand please don't be shy of just ra raising your hand right away and we'll open it up for, for questions especially if there's anything that you can't understand or if there's any lingo that you can't understand. Okay. So you can see in our screen uh, now our, our mission and like Jen was sharing with us in our quality committee meeting is we really like to ground all of our work in our mission uh, and every time I'm not going to read it for you guys but you see it there in your in your screen every time I see this mission it just reminds me of all the work that we did together as separate boards and communities coming together to come to to have this mission for our students thank you the next slide mark so we want to present the continuous improvement plan in the context of all of the other plans that we're writing for the Agency of Education. Some of you who attended the Ed Quality Committee meeting in um, April will recognize these slides. I lifted them but I, from that presentation, but I thought that it was important for the public in general to know this and for our teachers as well. And just so you know, this presentation was shared with our faculty and staff as part of the Mar uh, May 25th half day in service day. I sped through that presentation because they had so much other important work to do and the video was if we recorded it, it was about 15 minutes. I think tonight we're going to slow it down. It'll, it'll take a little bit longer. It'll be a little bit more thorough. But again, I just want you to understand that this is part of, um, it's one of a number of plans that we need to write to satisfy state requirements and we want to build coherence in this system. It does not make sense to us to have different goals for uh, different plans. They need to all come together. So we have to do plans such as you can see here, the ARP ESSER plan. Uh, we talked about that at a community forum a couple of uh, months ago. We have our recovery plan, what we call our moving forward plan. We have the continuous improvement plan. Jody has its own special continuous improvement plan because they are identified as benefiting from comprehensive supports. Um, and then we have the school-wide program plan, which is a, a plan that I put together so that we have flexibility in the use of our federal funds so that we can serve more students. Next slide. So most recently, you've seen the ARP ESSER work. This is just some snips from the, the template and the website. Again, we've received an influx of federal monies to support our students through this pandemic. Um, and so the third source of, or the third influx of funds 
is that um, ESSER 3, it's now known as the ARP ESSER funds, and, um, and we've been committed to engaging publicly uh, about the use of those funds. So that's one plan. Next slide. Again, at the end of March, we were submitting our um, public plan for spending the money. So again, this is just a SNP, and we are required to uh, revise that, or at least review the plan every six months. So we keep that um, as an ongoing activity in our repertoire so that we can uh, engage our teachers and staff and, and the community. Next slide. <laughs> And just a reminder that I had, I did a video overview of that present of, of that plan last spring, and that's just again a, a little snip from um, from that the website, so that folks know that they can always publicly access that information. Next slide. The state has simplified the continuous improvement planning template, which is really welcome news. They know that we have these ARP ESSER plans and moving forward slash recovery plans. So this is just an example of what the template looks like. We'll get into it more a little later. Um, bottom line is that we now are doing continuous improvement planning at the district level, not at the individual school level. And we're required to have two goals, one related to safe and healthy schools and the second related to academic achievement. Those categories fit really beautifully with the moving forward slash recovery plan. Um, and so you're gonna see that we've moved things in from those plans to, to fulfill this requirement. Next slide. Again, just a reminder, um, DOTI gets to do its own little thing additionally, um, and they are engaged in some uh, Plan Do Study Act cycles um, so that they can continue to receive support um, in terms of some technical assistance and funding uh, for a school improvement. Next slide. And then just to bring everybody sort of up to speed, uh, this was up to the place where I presented for the Ed Quality Committee back in April. We have since conducted the comprehensive needs assessment. We, uh, with Michelle's help, uh, created the data, updated it with our new sources of data. We're gonna share some of that with you, not all of it. It would take us hours to share all of it with you. Um, and let's see, we're gonna, the annual snapshot is released, so we're gonna share with you some data related to the SBAC and BITSA. We're gonna share with you um, the draft goals. We're in the process of engaging stakeholders and we wanna address equity issues. Jonas, I see your hand is raised. Um, so I wanted to jump in uh, and, and just ask this question. When you said that DOTI receives technical support, what, what does that mean? That means I, I, this, it's really an inconsequential question. I just want to ask the first question and get it rolling. <laughs> <laughs> it means that um, we have a liaison at the Agency of Education who's, um, I'm going to forget her exact title, but she works like with the Ed Quality Division. And she and Gillian and I primarily touch base on a regular basis. We engage in some monitoring, and she helps us figure out how best to leverage those funds. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, okay, great. Uh, next slide. All right, so Aaron is gonna share a little bit more about this, the next uh, few slides. Good evening, I'm Aaron Boynton, principal at Berlin. I have a number of slides tonight, and as Jen mentioned, um, we're going to look at some data. And uh, <clears throat> the first the first slide here, uh, actually the next number of slides, there's a link at the top when you look at this digitally um, for a more comprehensive needs assessment. There's a lot more graphs and, and uh, re reports when it comes to looking at, at data. But we're going to look at um, <clears throat> the SBAC and uh, <clears throat> the Vermont Science Test as well. Um, we recognize that there are some discrepancies or some differences um, that we have pointed out in the data that we'll look at when we look at the slides. The um, Smarter Balanced Assessment is the big state assessment that everybody does. Our um, standardized big test at the end of the year, we're still, well I think we're all wrapping it up at this point doing makeups. 
Um, but uh, it, you know, is a number of days of, of some pretty intense assessment, starting in third grade, going up. Does it go to 11th or 12th? Ninth. Ninth? Okay, the 11th is for science, but. So next slide. <clears throat> so this first one is SBAC literacy data by grade compared to the state, how the state performed. Um, so you can see in red how the district performed. Uh, by grade level, and um, the, the blue is compared to the state. Um, so most most grades, uh, we are above state average, other than eighth grade right now. Um, and I'll, you'll note too that literacy is stronger than our, our math results. Um, so this these results are from last year's tests taken in the spring, and considering we were one of the few schools coming in person during the pandemic. Next slide. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting and concerning. Um, this is SBAC literacy performance disaggregated by poverty and by students uh, on IEPs or special education. So the chart on the left uh, looks at the red is students that receive free and reduced lunch, which is what we use to determine our quote unquote poverty rate. Uh, compared to the blue percentage on the right, the students not, that are not free and reduced lunch. And the chart on the right, um, IEP students versus, or compared to non-IEP students. And these are students that met proficiency, so scoring on the SBAC, it's one, two, three, four, scoring a three or a four, which is uh, at or above proficiency. So we can definitely see um, the difference and the need for supporting students in uh, on, on IEPs and uh, that are free and reduced. Next slide, please. So this is looking at math. As you can see, lower than literacy, uh, but still as a district above state average. So this is grades three to nine, uh, and uh, red is district and blue is state. Next slide. Erin, can I oh, time out sure. for just a sec? We have two board members with their hands raised on the oh. video screen. Is it okay with you guys if we do the presentation and come back to your questions? Is that okay? Yes. I think I okay. Thanks. Okay, go ahead, Erin. Thanks. Uh, so similarly, compared to the uh, literacy slides we just saw, this is the math. Again, right side for the uh, right chart, free and reduced lunch versus non-free and reduced lunch. Again, students that met proficiency. And for special education students, um, the graph on the right, um, you can see the difference there in students that met proficiency, special ed versus non-special ed. So we definitely recognize that we have um, some work to do for those students that are um, free and reduced and uh, special ed. Next slide. And then this is the Vermont Science assessment. Uh, this is fifth grade, eighth grade, and eleventh grade. And this simply shows our results as a district in red versus the state um, state results on the right. And um, again, those that meet or, or are above proficient. And uh, I think that's my last slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Jess is up next. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jess Wills. I've seen you on the screen for the last two years. I've been attending school board meetings, so it's nice to finally be here in person and see you all face to face. I'm the new assistant principal at U32. I guess not new really anymore, although it still feels it. Um, this has been my first year. I am going to talk about the current graduation rate. As you can see, the trend line is headed downwards, which is not the direction that we want it to go. We acknowledge this. Um, we see that it's a problem for sure, and we want to address it. Some things that you should know about how the state calculates the graduation rate. Um, students that drop out for youth build or adult basic ed are counted in this graduation rate. Um, so 
you know, that counts against us, even though they're moving on into other programs. Additionally, if a student completes graduation the day after the next school year starts, or further days after that, they count as having technically dropped out. Um, so that's some information, but we know that the trend line is definitely headed in the wrong direction, and we are prepared to address it. Next slide. Hi, I'm Kat Fair. I'm the principal of Cal's Elementary. And I wanted to chat a little bit about, I can't see it. I wanted to chat a little bit about the slides on behavior data. On this slide and on the next one as well, what you'll see is we have behavior incidents broken down by the number of events that occur per student. I don't know if that's easy to understand or not. This means 129 students um, at the elementary level um, had an office discipline referral form. That means that there was a referral to the office for a challenging behavior. Um, 129 elementary students were in the one to five categories of referrals, and the numbers go down for six to 10 events, 11 to 15 events, and up to over 20. And if you get to the next slide, you will see that that is similar at U32. A lot happen at the one to five. I think it's important for you to keep in mind that when we're looking at um, the number of referrals in either um, age group, most of the time, what we do for most students works. So that first category of one to five events, like a trip to the principal's office or a chat with someone often gets a kid to turn things around. And so that's a good thing. That's a good sign that our universal um, approach is working. Um, I think if we had a chance to look at this historically, that we would see that these numbers, even in that first category, are higher than what we would normally see. Um, next slide, Mark. This is another way to look at, I'm sorry. I'm, do I sound distorted a little? Okay. This is another way to look at the data. When we, okay, I love microphones so much. Sorry. Um, uh, this is a different way to look at the data. This um, chart breaks down what's the nature of each incident. So anytime a student goes over 20 referrals, what we're looking at is what the majority of the time is the cause behind it. Um, in this one for elementary, it looks at, looks like defiance behavior and physical aggression are the top three, and disrespect is a close second. And if you switch to the next slide mark on U32, you would see, ooh, it changes a little bit. Um, behavior and class cut, which there's not really a, a similar thing to look at at the elementary level, um, and bus incidents. Disrespect is also um, pretty high there. I think a couple of things stand out for me on the type of issue um, that gets referred. Um, if you, Mark, could you go back on slide? If you were to look at the, the three top categories, disrespect, disrupting class, and defiance, what in the world is the difference between those three things? I think there is some um, language that we need to be working on. Um, how we each de define what are these things. So they can, we can really hone in on what are the things to address. And if you go to, back to the next slide on U32, um, I think what stands out for me the most in terms also the defiance and the disrespect, but class cuts, I think that speaks to engagement. So when we go forward to the next slide and start to talk a little bit more about our um, continuous improvement plan goal around safe and healthy schools, we're gonna to wanna to talk about those two things. Jess, I know I just went over elementary and high school behavior. Is there anything that you would add that you feel like I'm missing? I mean, I can speak to the class cuts, I guess, but. Do you, want, do you wanna talk about that? Sure, I can talk a little bit about the class cuts. Um, we recognize that it's an issue. We've talked a lot about um, the, the data that was separated by students, like which students are the re-offenders for class cuts and why, and what's, what's going on for them. I've had many restorative conversations with them and dove into what's going on. 
Um, it connects to what Kat said about the engagement issue. We are starting a RISE program, which is restorative in school experience, where we plan to um, provide a space that will help with those engagement concerns, um, partnering with teachers and the restorative in school experience coordinator, uh, writing EST plans and establishing short-term goals for students and accomplishing those goals and moving forward. Um, it's also a strong partnership with families to bring families back into the building and help us partner uh, in changing the experience for their students. Thank you, Jess. Um, you're making me think of one more uh, point that I think is really important. If you think about those, those first two slides that I showed you about the number of students you have one to five incidents reported. Um, I acknowledge that those numbers were pretty high, higher than what we would have seen in years past. And hearing what Jess is um, describing at U32 in terms of engagement and the class cuts, um, I think that there are implications for our work going forward where we need to think about what is our tier one approach to supporting all students. Um, we often have students who are identified for needs um, and you'll see them represented in those incidents that are 16 or 20 or more incidents by student. But before they get there, it would be great if universally we were really thinking about how we support all students. Next slide, Mark, should be the goal. Okay. Um, this is our current draft um, for safe and healthy schools. You'll notice that it is aligned with our moving forward recovery plan. <coughs> Um, I think a couple of these points I made earlier, we need to develop more consistency in reporting behavior data so that we can provide more consistent support. We want our students in their classrooms for general instruction. The, and I think that Jess was getting at that when she was talking about um, at the high school level, the engagement and class cuts. But even in the elementary school, we don't have to worry about kids cutting class, but we do have to worry about whether or not they're engaged in their learning. Um, I think, I'm trying to think. One of the things I just want to point out under the um, prioritized strategies, we did talk about, as we did in the moving forward plan, the, that we are hoping to see that SEL lessons, remember with the increase in counselors and SEL being taught within the classroom, the intention was that we would increase the amount of time when kids were engaging in that proactive work and that it may lead to greater outcomes for students, meaning that they are accessing this social emotional learning and not having as many challenges. Um, that does not mean that I'm saying we do not have a need for counselors. I think we do have a need for counselors. Um, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that was that part was really transparent. So this next slide is our draft academic achievement goal, which is aligned with our moving forward and recovery plan. Um, and this is one that I really find super exciting because it also really ties into our equity work and looking really deeply and honestly and taking hard looks at our systems and what is it that is happening that is creating barriers for some of our students to achieve? So the goal is to reduce the difference in math uh, performance uh, between historically marginalized groups and other groups. So that slide with the free and reduced lunch and non-FRL looking to reduce that gap and so it's really about looking at high quality instruction, tying in with those behaviors, looking at the behaviors and saying, huh, are these behaviors and this lack of engagement, is it a student issue or is it a teacher issue? Do we have engaging curricula for our, uh, for our students and are we meeting them where they're at and really taking those hard looks that we need to take at our instruction and how we're meeting our learners where they're at, especially now given the fact that we are 24 months of disrupted education for our students. Next slide, please. So one thing, another thing that we're doing, which is 
I think really exciting also is thinking about budgeting now. As you know, even before this year or next year's budget passed, we're already thinking into the future and really thinking about how are we going to frame our thinking understanding that through the ARPESR funds, we have a number of grant-funded positions, and we're going to have to take a hard look at these and really think about how are we going to present a budget to the public next year that addresses our needs. And so we, the school board has set a parameter for us, and it is around the um, initiative to achieve significant improvement in math and or literacy proficiency proficiency for students on an IEP plan and or who qualify for free and reduced lunch. So that's an ambitious goal, but it's, I think, going to really help us as we think about the hard choices that we have and the hard conversations we're going to be needing to have as we're thinking about budgeting moving forward, really focusing us in on what we need to do. And Jen. Yeah, great. Thank you. Next slide, Mark. So again, I just want to make sure everybody's clear about some next steps. Um, we're in the process of soliciting feedback. So again, I shared this with everybody in inside the school community last week, and we're sharing it now. I also uh, put it in the community letter last week and put a link to the feedback form. So the feedback form is going to be open until this Friday, the 3rd. And then we'll take that feedback um, and revise goals as necessary. And then I am really hopeful that you all will then approve the continuous improvement plan on June 15th. Um, and then let me say one other thing about that. It would be great to do that. Then uh, the other thing I hope that you're noticing is that is the similarity between all the plans so that we really are trying to establish some coherence. I think that's gonna help all of us. And we also know that at some point down the line, uh, when the timing seems right, we have a strategic planning process to engage in. And I think that's gonna poise us well for the years to come when we're able to do that. Next slide. So this is just um, a little bit more information about the feedback form. These are the questions on the feedback form. That's just a little snip of it. And as of the last time I checked, which was about three hours ago, we had 44 responses, which is great. Uh, mostly questions and clarifications. So what I'll plan to do is um, sift through all of, those in, uh, all of those responses and then make sure that big themes are part of the report that I'll provide to you on the 15th. Um, and Mark has put the link to the feedback form again in the chat. I'll mention it one more time in tomorrow's community letter, and, and we'll see what we get. So that is the presentation. I know some of you might have had some questions or some feedback. So um, Mark, if you want to stop sharing the screen now, thank you. And then Flora, I think we can take questions and comments. OK, do we have any questions? I know that Jonas and Chris have been patiently waiting. Chris at the moment, but I see Diane's hand up. So, Diane? I'm fine if you go to Chris or Jonas first. Okay, Chris, I see you on now. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the um, uh, information and the presentation. It was really very helpful. Um, so, the it seems that there's a significant difference, maybe just uh, between free and reduced lunch and non-free and reduced lunch students um, across the board. Um, same thing for IEP students and non-IEP students. Based on the data that we've collected um, so far, is there a sense as to what the root cause of that discrepancy is? So that if we're going to move forward with a plan, we're identifying and addressing the root cause, or, or do we not know that? I think that we're still, and I'd invite my colleagues to speak up, in the process of trying to figure out the root cause. I think if we really knew the root cause, we wouldn't see these perpetual differences in performance that we've seen for years. We would have addressed it. Um, so that we are, we're still working on it. I don't know if you all want to. I, I would add to that. Here. So just as a follow, is there a sense as to how we're going to try and find out what the root cause is, Jen? And I know it's a, a Herculean task. Um, because of all the different 
factors that are involved? Yeah, so there are um, there are strategies and and to and tools and ideas um, that that we can engage in. We did some root cause analysis as part of the continuous improvement planning process two years ago when we engaged in it um, a little bit more, I'd say sort of thoroughly with the technical assistance of the Agency of Education. And we can go back and do some, you know, asking there's a protocol, for example, that's a, like, it's like the five whys, really trying to, dig more deeply into why do we have the results that we have and then what does that mean? What are the actions that we might take to then address the root cause? Those are the sorts of things that we would need to be engaging in. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I'll let my colleagues now ask questions. Thank you very much. One, one of the things that I would have wanted to add to that is you'll notice that we keep talking about historically marginalized uh, populations. And the things, the places where we have measures are for students who are living under the poverty level or as defined by free and reduced lunch and students who um, qualify for special education. Those are not, that is not a snapshot of every child who has been historically marginalized. Um, so I think we have work to do there. Anybody else from the staff wants to chime in before we move on? No. Okay. Uh, let's see. Jonas, do you want to go? And then I'll have Diane go. Yep. I wonder, can we compare this data to uh, statewide data for anything other than the SBACs? Yeah. For example, the, the, the delta between, you know, FRL and non-FRL. It'd be great to be able to compare that against some kind of baseline and also over time. So right, right now, we might be able to do a little bit more, Jonas, with that larger data set during the testing window where we don't have a lot of access to the statewide data. They sort of take that away while we're in an active testing window, but we can get back in there when the testing window's over and see what we, if we can access more and make sense of it or compare. Anything else, Jonas? Good. Okay, Diane. So just to clarify, Jonas, were you asking basically what are the state numbers in terms of free and reduced lunch and special ed, which was one of mine. Yes. Thank you. The other question I had was in terms of the graduation rate, um, the two situations you described of those who are in, you know, the alternative type of a program, um, do we know how many of the that number might be in that situation or in the situation of graduating right out in, our, in the fall the following year. And also, have we started a conversation with those um, who have started to drop out as to what the situation is? Um, I have a list on my desk of the students who have dropped out in the past year. Um, our plan is to do some investigating as to why um, a survey, uh, for a lack of better way of gathering some inf initial information from them, um, just to get some feedback about how we can um, change their experience and um, shift that number. Additionally, um, the numbers that you're asking about, I don't specifically have those for previous years. I know we have two students headed to youth build currently. I don't know how many have dropped out in past years and are currently in youth build in addition to the two that have occurred this year. Um, and as far as the adult basic ed, I don't have a number for you on that. Um, I certainly could find that information out and report it out for you. Thank you, Jess and Dan. Do you have anything else? Good. Okay, hey, Natasha. Yes, just push yeah. yeah. okay. um, um, I have three questions. Do you want me to do one? Oh, computer, I think it just muted. Do you want me to do all three or just one? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, my first question is with the incidents by student, the one to five incidents, do you have data as to how many, like after one, because what you were talking about, 
a lot of the strategies that you're putting in place is one of the reasons why those numbers are dropping drastically. So do we have any data until like after one or two incidents, like what is the drop off right after that? We do. We do. Okay. Um, can I just be loud enough not to use it? No, just use it, just use it. Yeah, you're loud, but you love microphones, so use that. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. You can sing the response. <laughs> um, yeah, we do have that information at every single school, and it looks a little bit different at every school, okay. and each school has a team that looks at behavior data to try to figure out not just which student, but we can look at um, we identify where resources need to be deployed by looking at what time of day does it occur, okay. in what setting is it most likely to occur, who or what is the supervision during that time, um, what is disruption more often going to come up in the classroom versus defiance out on the playground, right? So we really do do a deep dive, but that is on a case by case basis in each school. Okay. Is that answer? Yes. Okay. Um, and then my second question still has to do with behavior. Out of curiosity, what is the difference between behavior, defiance, disrupting, <laughs> disrespecting? Oh, like, you nailed it. That's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it gets back to one of the points that I made earlier, which is um, that we are not really clear. So I said we're super clear on what that looks like in each one of our individual school teams. But when we start bringing it together in a forum like this, looking at a pre-K to six across five elementary buildings, we're noticing that it's dependent on the person who input the information. And our data queen, Michelle Sepka, would say, our data is only as good as what goes into it, right, when you're putting it in. Um, so as a district, we have a lot of work, not just on our school teams, but across the district to talk about how do we define defiance, disrespect, and disruption and um, make that a little easier so that I, I bet those numbers would be higher if we could really break down on each individual school. If you look at the notes that we keep mm -hmm. on each incident, um, it's falling into one of those other categories. I should say that one of the other ones that popped up that I didn't really hit on is physical aggression is on the rise in the way that it hasn't been in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my last, I guess, question slash comment um, under the goal for safe and health, healthy schools, it says we will decrease the demand for school counseling and nursing services to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and I guess what immediately came to mind to me is I think that the pandemic actually allowed our students to know that it's okay to seek help. Yeah. So keeping that in mind, do we want to drop back to pre-pandemic levels? Because are these greater levels really an indication of our students knowing it's okay and it's safe, and they should go seek that help as opposed to um, those increased levels being in response to the trauma and things that they're dealing with because of the pandemic. Another really great notice, Natasha. I think Jen could attest to the fact that Jen and Lisa LaPlante, the uh, director of student services here at U32, and I went round and round on what was the what's the right wording for that because we do want. Um, kids to identify how important it is to seek support and help um, and this needs to be a measurable goal and so we're looking at ways to measure this goal in this iteration what we're saying is um, we'd like to see the need go away not the use but the need to go away and hopefully if, if we bolster those proactive approaches by having SEL taught in the classroom in a consistent way with a common approach um, using the new framework that the state has provided, I think that we will make a lot of ground. I also, what, what isn't in here that I'd like to see is the number of incidents over five referrals would go down. Um, but that's speaking sort of in the negative. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next one. And just for the community, SEL, social and emotional learning. Just, just try to, oh, sorry. That's okay. But we'll try it. So next is Michaela. Um, I have a couple of questions also, but tagging on to that um, that you were just talking about, what's the time frame for it to go to pre-pandemic levels? Um, because working in you know healthcare as a family doctor, I don't think um, things are going to normalize for a long time when it comes to mental health. So, so you you two are just highlighting all the things that we need to work on with our language. The language matters. Um, yeah. yeah. The pre-pandemic uh, levels was another aspect that we wrestled with because 
not all of our schools had full-time nurses and not all of our schools had full-time counselors. And so there was so much unmet need. I don't know how we are going to compare apples to apples over time. Um, I am convinced we can say, this is what we're gonna do proactively and this is the response that we're getting. Um, and then I really liked what you brought up about the fact that looking just at the free and reduced lunch and the IEP does not, of course, measure every um, category of marginalized populations. Um, but specifically with universal school lunches being a thing, is free and reduced lunch going to be a measurement still? A meaningful Thank measurement? Thank you. Just... Want me to take that? Uh, yes. So. We receive our um, Title I funds as a, using poverty as a measure, and we use free and reduced lunch because we feel like it's the most accurate measure. And so we will be encouraging all of our families to still complete those applications so that we have really good numbers so that we can allocate our, our federal resources in particular in a way that is equitable. I guess I'm a little concerned that um by encouragement that people fill out that annoying form if it is not meaningful in terms of meaning. Yeah. We, we are pretty great. Luck with that. Um, and I think a lot of it a lot of it is in how you communicate the reason and the need behind it. So I I my style is to be pretty straight up with it and just let them let I let my families know that this really isn't about lunch, and it's about a lot of other things. Um, and so we had good completion rates. Sorry, I'm almost done. Um, I imagine some of this data has been broken down by school as well. It just wasn't presented tonight for timeliness. So um, I'm wondering if there are schools in our district who are, where that discrepancy is lower um, between those populations that we could look at as a model, and if not within our district, maybe other districts. Um, back to Jonas's point of looking statewide as well. I don't see any hands up to answer, to jump to that answer. That's a good idea. <laughs> the only thing. The only thing I will say about looking at the data by school is there's an N factor. We can't report numbers under 11, and um, especially when you look at school by grade levels, that N is very noticeable. So when you're, con this is a, it's a classic Doty issue. <laughs> not just Doty, not just Doty, but it's, part of why we're a school in need of continuous improvement. But when you're thinking about how percentages work, um, it, there are all kinds of, so first off, the smaller total N you have. N, N being the number. Oh, the N, yes. oh, the N is the total yes. number. Yes. Yes. And then for some of the data that we get from the state, they say, well, if you don't have more than 11 students, or it skews it a little bit. N equals student number. N, yes. N equals N the number of students, That's yes. It makes them too identifiable, the individual. Yes. Okay. Not everybody. Yeah. McKenna, do you have one more? I have one more question, um, which is, you know, because if you look at some of those data, it's like, yay, we're doing better than the state, but like the numbers don't actually look good to me. So I'm curious if there's a, a either a statewide goal um, or a and or a district goal for these numbers. So I'm not aware of a statewide goal, although I haven't attended the state meetings recently. Um, and for us, we had talked about increasing student performance significantly. We still have some work to do. And this is one of those conversations that is always hard because we want it to be 100% of our students. And we also want to set goals that we think that we can meet in the short term. So that's sort of a tension that we always experience. Um, but also thinking about other measures besides the SBAC and the VITSA. For example, we administer the iReady math 
diagnostic, and there's a growth report in that, um, in that assessment. It talks about uh, what we would strive for for typical growth, and then it talks about stretch growth. And so for our students who are not meeting the standards at a particular point in time, we're looking at their stretch growth goals more so that ultimately they'll make more progress. Those are sources of data that are a little bit more helpful than SBAC or BITSA um, for that kind of work. I guess statewide uh, Act 173 attempts to help with 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 some of this. Uh, there's been some literacy efforts that PCP funding, even though it's just for building quality and some of the infrastructure, it's also attempts to help. And the, the S287 about the way it's studied too, it's an attempt to help for, for that statewide. And Mag, you had your hand up a minute ago. So. Just one. Just come on. Yeah. Let it go. Yeah. There. No, no, no. Oh, okay. you have to hold it. Once. You have to hold it. Press it once. Just hold it. No, you have to hold it. There you go. You have to hold it. I have one question. Okay. We heard how the behavior data showed an increase, but I don't recall hearing whether the academic data showed a significant difference from pre-pandemic in the presentation. And it, so love to know the answer to that. Um, has performance declined academically compared to um, pre-COVID? So we did not provide comparative data over the years. And I cannot remember off the top of my head how it compares. And I would say that that some of the data is old, right? So we didn't have spring 2020 data. There was no statewide assessment program. And so um, really in this particular body of analysis, we were less inclined to look at our historical trends than what was currently in front of us. Uh, that, was, that was the decision that we made in presenting the data. Okay. Second question is have behavior staffing or behavioral supports reduced compared to pre pandemic? So I'll start. Um, actually, that's like a beautiful segue to some of what I'm going to talk to you about when we talk about vacancies um, and some of what we've experienced in some of our schools. And my last two questions are um, both related to SBAC and um, IEPs. I wonder if someone can describe some of the SBAC accommodations that are provided for students on IEPs, and if we could get some examples of some of how those accommodations are mirrored and prioritized um, during the school year special ed programming. When you say mirrored, what? I wouldn't say prepared or mirrored. Um, if a student is on an IEP or an ESC or a 504 plan, they have accommodations in those plans. Those accommodations in those plans should be the accommodations they receive during testing, right? So it's not that we prepare students for testing, but really it's what do they need in the day to day? So do they need a separate setting, a quiet environment, more breaks, someone to read it for them, someone to scribe for them, things like that. Does that make sense? Um, one thing I would add is that some students during the school year, part of their IEP is to have instruction at their level, their academic level. That isn't something that the SBAC can do because it can only test at their grade level. And uh, when we look at our IEP data, one of the things that we're starting to do, and, and Michelle's going to look at for us, is um, under the current model, it's a discrepancy model to qualify for special education. So by definition, in order to qualify for a special education plan, you have to um, 
uh, be 1.5 standard deviations below the norm. So what we're really looking at also in terms of uh, our students on IEPs is are our students who have learning differences making growth at the same rate as our students who don't have those learning differences because um, you know it's it's an unfair comparison just straight up like that so really breaking down and looking at growth and that's where the um, I ready uh, growth and stretch growth data is really great to look at thank you oh. Maggie is that is that it okay hey, Eric yes thank you so one of the uh, one of the things you spoke about was engagement with students to help with behavioral problems and other um, things that might come about. And I was wondering if there was any look into, you know, we can control engagement in the classroom and in the school, but engagement outside uh, of school, you know, at the home, uh, via homework, stuff like that, you know, ways that, you know, <laughs> some families m might have ways to engage after school hours where other families might need help doing that um and if there's been any look at that like as a father of a of an elementary school um student you know not having any homework um has kind of been a surprise to us but you know we supplement with other with other things um that we're able to but you know, for those that aren't able to, you know, having that engagement outside of school, has that been something that has been looked into as a way to kind of improve some scores and such? I'm not sure if I'm fully able to answer your question, Eric, um, but I heard you ask a couple of questions. I heard you say something about homework, and I heard you say something about what can we do at home. Um, it is my foundational belief that all students will do well if they can and that's them as individuals and then when we start talking about issues like homework um you what my experience has been with students has been that we are offering often measuring a family's ability to support their child at home which for me becomes an equity issue um the we don't have the ability to support children outside of the environment in school. Um, so it just begs us to really focus in on what are the consistent routines and expectations we can have for all of our students to achieve. I don't know if that fully answered your question, but that, that's my start. Right, I also think engagement is, um, it's really about are we teaching the concepts that we need to teach in a way that that, that our students can um, can access. So I think you know I think of a classic example from my own teaching career where I taught To Kill a Mockingbird for years because it's a classic and um, you know I read it and uh, it's just sort of what you did in middle school English and then what we had to look at as, a, as an English faculty is we had to look at and say okay why are we teaching this and are we really is this a book that kids can relate to and, and engage with and so we shifted around we gave choice instead of just having all of the kids read one book we um, looked at what are the themes and the concepts that we were trying to teach and we got um, a whole set of different books we actually used World War II books um, tied it into social studies and then all of a sudden you know the first year we did it kids were like oh I love this this is great and so part that's what part of engagement is about is really looking at what are we teaching how are we teaching it and you know even if we have something that might be a favorite unit that we've done that we really like does it really make meet the needs of our students or match where they're Do you have another question, Eric? Uh, no, thank you for that answer. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Diane? 
So just a, just a couple of other ones. So one, I was realizing too, um, if when you talk with um, those who have dropped out, I think a, a, a question that would be helpful to me on the Education Quality Committee would also be, when did you first think about um, not finishing school? Because I'm hearing from different families that um, in elementary, some kids are really struggling and feeling pushed um, out. So that I think would be helpful to know. Um, in terms of the behavior, it would be helpful to me if I had a sense of what is that number in comparison. I realize I should know how many are in elementary, but I don't really know the number, and I don't really know the total number in U32. And then the other part, part of it, and this is a slippery slope because I don't want to be comparing school to school, but I can have a better understanding of how disruptive it might be if I know what's the percentage in some of our schools in terms of that. So I'm not asking for that information now. I'm just thinking as we're looking at, at data. Um, and then the other part of it is, um, I think many of us feel SBAC isn't the only and isn't actually um, as accurate or important that it is. And that's not a cop out to say, well, we're not doing very well, so I don't believe in SBAC. It's more so we know that there are lots of unfair parts of it and that it doesn't accurately not our kids can't demonstrate what they know through this measure and so I do think it's very important for us to work together to have a system that reflects and um, provides changes to our instruction as needed for our learners. I can tell you today Diana um, when I was looking at data we currently have 1489 active students in our schools um, and it's pretty close to a 50-50 split. Yeah, and Diane, I'll respond to the SBAC. I, I'm glad that you brought that up. We talk a lot and in Ed Quality as well about the importance of triangulating data, looking at lots of sources of data so that we can more fully understand our students' performance so that we can uh, both respond to individual students but respond as a system overall. Uh, tonight's the choice to support, to show just the SBAC and VITSA or to highlight that was intentional only because it hasn't been publicly available until now. And, um, and, and if you dug more deeply into that comprehensive needs assessment, there's, there's some other sources of data available and we'll continue to do that in monitoring reports. Um, for tonight, though, that was, uh, I'll take responsibility for making that decision to, to highlight the statewide data. Thank you, Jen. Okay, I have a couple questions um, to kind of tie into the dropout rates. And I'm guessing we don't have numbers on students who leave and go to other schools for reasons other than their parents moving. But do we do exit interviews with them to find out why they might be leaving? Because I think that could help us understand things. And then We've talked about engagement, not just with class cuts, but with students who are physically in the classroom but might not be engaged. Do we have a way to meaningfully measure that so that we can track it and see how we're doing? I think that comes into the behavior and, and um, how do we what's the language that we're using and are we using a common language because some disengaged students sit very quietly and, and, and look engaged and aren't and there's really no way to measure that but you know there are the I think that's where you sort of start to see the the fidgeting behavior or the calling out or um, so that's what it's a really good question and it really comes down to what's the common language that we're using and you know you have to make sure that everybody's concept you know this is an apple what makes it an apple is you know that really solid working definition of each of the terms that we have so that we are actually comparing the same thing even within buildings I couldn't see it. It helps no, I, I, I was going to share just a little bit. A couple other things just to um, 
supplement with Gillian said, there are some things that we can look for, right? Some common things like um, asking questions, answering questions, engaging in a discussion with a peer, those sorts of things. And that takes an opportunity for all of us to calibrate our practice and talk about instructional leadership a lot. We haven't done that very much this year or last year, uh, all things considered. I think the other thing is um, I have seen, and this was pre-pandemic, there have been some tools I've seen mostly actually at the upper elementary school where a teacher might have like an engagement scale and just and sort of on a spectrum, this is compliance, I'm doing it because my teacher's telling me to do it versus I'm doing this because I'm really interested and I want to learn this. And I have seen a few teachers use that engagement scale with their kids to just sort of take stock of where they are at a moment in time and why they might be experiencing, you know, feeling the way that they're feeling, assessing themselves where they would. And then my final question was on the academic achievement goal. And you talk about a overall increase in the marginalized students, but you also talk about a reduction in the difference between the non-marginalized and the marginalized students. Depending on what practices you put in, it's green. Hello. We lost our battery, I think. Got it? Oh. <laughs> no battery. I'll just speak really loud. Um, depending on the practices that you put into place to help increase your um, performance or proficiency for these students, you could see like this universal surge, which would be great. That's not a bad thing. But have you guys talked about how you're going to try to identify or what, like if there's no change in the difference, are you going to still, have you talked about that measurement? This, to the extent that um, we've talked about routinely progress monitor, monitoring our data so that we can see is what we're doing effective, especially with groups of students who need to make that stretch growth or more achievement. And if, it's, if we're not seeing evidence that it's having an impact, then what's the next thing that we can try? Those sorts of things. But we do want to see both. We want to see everybody improve, and we want to reduce those differences in performance among some groups. <coughs> Any other questions for board members? I have a couple too. Do you have one more? No, I'm good. <coughs> All right. Yeah. Oh. Okay, anybody on the line? Oh, okay. <coughs> so I, I have, uh, I, I picked up on the same that everybody's been talking about. Then we were reduced to the number of individual school council and visits pre-pandemic levels, and I'm wondering if we, if there's a way to just strike that sentence. I feel like you know better now, and I, I think that we always say that language matters, and we create this narrative about our priorities, and we're always meeting student needs. So it seems to me that that is kind of an arbitrary measure to try to go back, because we're always focusing on the student needs at the time. So I, I would say that, I, I, to me, that one was not meaningful. In that, you know, like I know what you were trying to say, but and I know we need that great measuring, but I, that wouldn't be my my preference. Uh, and then, but I would like to see something about a uh, professional, I mean that safe and healthy school goals, right? Because so, we do know it. So social and emotional le uh, lessons uh, led by school counselors. Uh, so that is sort of in a way you're also saying that you provide professional development for the teachers so that the teachers can meet 80% of the student needs. So I feel like that's what I want to see. That, so how many teachers are participating, right? That the high school level. I know that you guys are all participating every week in professional development, right? So I don't know how that is. I feel like that would be a better mission. I, I don't know. That's, uh, that's a question. Uh, and then in this same, in, in the quality, in, in the academic achievement, you do have examined belief systems and implicit bias related to historically modernized. I think that applies to the safe and healthy schools too, and it's not redundant. So maybe add as number five to, uh, to, to that. Yeah. Okay, so anything else, Jen? Yeah, I just wanna say, when, when we drafted that goal, we took that, the, the um, reducing the visits to the pre-pandemic level, lifted that straight from that RFSR plan, that, and 
Um, and I think the one thing I would say overall for us to continue to consider, um, we've said, we talked about this earlier in Ed Quality about global citizenship is, um, and again tonight, year-round budgeting, right? And just that reminder that we're gonna have some of what we're funding right now, we're funding with federal funds that are slated to go away. And just as we continue to have our budget conversations, we're gonna need to prioritize the things that are the most important things because um, it is unlikely that we're gonna be able to afford everything that we're funding with federal funds. So um, I just wanted to put that out there that these are the conversations we're gonna continue to have. Um, and, and when we're analyzing data, thinking about that too, so that we know what are the things that our kids need the most that we then fund and carry forward. Seeing that we don't have any more questions. No, nope, I'm just fidgeting. Really like, sorry. <laughs> yeah. okay. I, I, well, first, want to thank Jen and staff for putting such a great presentation together and also for being here uh, with us. Uh, so let's move into reports, uh, Superintendent. Okay. So this was normally we wouldn't have a superintendent report necessarily during this particular uh, meeting, the first meeting of the month. And last time you asked me to come to you with a recommendation regarding year-round staff, you made determinations about the last day of school for students and the last day of school for year-round staff. So you have my recommendation right now in the packet. Um, I'm recommending that uh, we honor uh, Juneteenth, the federal observance of Juneteenth on Monday, June 20th, and I'm recommending that at least for this year it be a floating holiday. It's late in the year, and we do have a few folks who have work commitments that they cannot change on Monday the 20th. Um, and then for the sake of, um, of being equitable and honoring the, the challenges that all of our staff have faced, including our year-round of the staff, I would suggest that you um, grant two paid vacation days as well to year-round staff. Thank you, Jen. So can I have a motion? Yes. Uh, so I'll move that we um, accept the recommendation for year round staff in 21 22. Can I have a second? I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. So moved by Kari, second by Lindy. Any other discussion or questions? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Seeing none, the motion carries. I just want to thank you, Jen, for putting it together. This was really important for the board. And just again, want to thank the year-round staff. And we thank that our teachers at our previous meetings. But a lot of you are here or year-round, and we know that we are. Your guys are keeping our schools going by subbing, by doing a lot of extra things, and especially the study staff. We we're not a user to the last time, I just saw a couple of them willing around there. So thank you for all you do. And with that, uh, yeah, moving to the wrong. Sorry, too many packages, packages here. So then let's move to personnel. And I'm like giving the eye to Lindy. Approved new teachers' resignations. <laughs> all right. Um, the new teacher nominations. The first one is spelled differently on two pages, so I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Rory. It is Rory, okay. Uh, Rory Hutchinson, uh, U32 Spark Center teacher. Uh, Philip Montenegro, U32 World Languages. James Hasseltine, East Montpelier grade six. Matthew David, U32 Music. Thank you, Lindy. Can I have a second? Thank you, Perry. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Yeah. So excited to be hiring, hiring, snowing. How hard it's been to you guys. So, Jen, update. Oh, no, we have oh, a resignation. Oh, no, that's true. We have one. There is yeah. Yes, sir. I make a motion to accept the resignation of Sarah Sprague, Doty Art Teacher. Second. Lindy and Ursula, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 
Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Now update. Now update. Okay. So um, we are still, we're thrilled that we've hired these people and we still have some hiring to do. Um, again, we are experiencing still a, um, a big shortage in uh, special ed candidates for some positions. So folks primarily at U32 are really thinking about how are, we, how are we going to meet our students' needs next year if we're not fully staffed in special education. So there's a lot of thinking and brainstorming about that and there's still active recruitment going on to, to try to find folks. Um, we have a, um, still a speech language pathologist vacancy open. We're still looking for a classroom teacher um, at Doty. We are um, moving forward with some other hiring for um, some a PE and health position as well. We hope to bring more to you next uh, next time. We have had um, two vacancies, one for almost the entire year, and the second one since about um, the beginning or middle of March. Uh, one's at Rumney, one's at Callis, and they are school-wide uh, behavior support positions. It's had a huge impact on our ability to support our kids universally, and it's meant that our principals have done a lot of uh, behavior support and less instructional leadership. Those vacancies remain open, and so one of the things, um, well, let me back up, last time I planted some seeds for you all about some of our needs and what the market is and what, how we might need to do things cre uh, differently and creatively, um, for example, and maybe something that might not have been budgeted the first time around. Right now we're looking at how can we meet those behavior needs. Um, and respond to our kids' behaviors right now. As you heard, those, there, there are increases in behavior from previous years. And so we are exploring the possibility of coming to you with a um, recommendation to kind of revamp, to look at making those positions that are currently funded, um, supported as paraeducator positions, possibly coming for, with more of a teacher position, behavioral coach kind of position. Um, and then looking, we are also having trouble recruiting an elementary social worker, and so we're looking at maybe using some of that money uh, for next year and revamping these two positions. So um, Caroline and Kat and Kara Holden are doing a lot of work and a lot of thinking about that, and we'll, we'll see what we're ready to bring to you in the future. Um, we also have a lot of paraeducator vacancies for next year right now, so we're working on getting those posted and filled, but I think this morning when I reviewed them with Carla, I think we had 11 paraeducator openings right now that we're trying to fill. So, am I forgetting anything? There's a ton of urgency with what you're saying. <laughs> urgency, and Caroline? I think you should use the mic, yeah. Um, I just have to add that at Rumney, it isn't only the administrator being affected, it's classroom teachers. Because um, we have been without a behavior support since um, October, and um, in our handbook, teachers handle level one behaviors, administrators handle level two and three. At Rumney this year, teachers are holding a lot of the behaviors in their classroom. Um, at the last board meeting, Diane mentioned hearing the system creak under the pressure, and that's exactly what has been happening. Um, so, I just didn't want it to go without mentioning that, yeah, that a lot of it's fallen on classroom teachers, our school counselor, and our school nurse. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Jen, for the update. So, that is of our meeting I have a couple of things just to put out I'm gonna follow up with a little email it's all scheduling stuff but I remind to some of you that had already said yes to the retreat haven't said yes to in the invitation so if you don't mind I know the ones that couldn't come but if you don't mind just responding to that that'll be great I'll be sending some information out about uh, location and time but what I really wanted to uh, remind you today is that the, uh, the board participates in graduation so if you want to participate in the graduation, you can just be at graduation as a, 
as the public, but you can also participate. So we'll be sending some information out, be in the look for it to respond so that our U32 staff can plan for that. And our elementary schools also have graduations of the 16, so you know board members are encouraged to participate too. So please coordinate with the principals. We'll be sending some information out. So 16 and 17. And, uh, and the 15th is our meeting and it's eighth grade celebration. Yeah, and the 15 and the 15th is our meeting and it's eighth grade celebration. 15 is remote meeting. And that's, I think that's it. That's all I have to. Yeah, but we'll be following up for any with an email, but just like be sure to answer. Thank you. If you haven't been, the U32 graduation is, is hands down a highlight of my board year. Yeah. It's really fun, everybody, you know, we take turns, everybody gets to participate, and that's why we're all here for the kids, right? And same with the elementary schools, it's just the best time. Okay, so a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Thank Second. You. Thank you, Natasha and Wendy. All those in favor, please, uh, what, did I forget something? No. Aye. Hi. 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 Okay. Hi. Okay. I'm not even going to ask for a post. Because <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.